I can also go to our website, which is nephiproject.com, and see what we've been doing over there. It's really an honor for me uh, to speak to you today because I have my partner here. It's the first time in the U.S. I've ever had the chance to do a presentation with uh, my exploring partner and uh, dear friend Richard Willington. Um, and so I really, uh, it's a real privilege for me. Now, what were we doing in the northwest corner of Saudi Arabia where research began? Uh, we were trying to find the Saudi Arabian or the Arab Arabian candidate for Mount Sinai. And after several attempts, we found the mountain. That led us then to a town called Al Bada, which is uh, by oral tradition there, the home of Jethro. The uh, assistant to the mayor of the town told us that, oh, if you're really interested in Moses, what you should see is the waters of Moses on the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. So we traveled there, and what we found was a candidate what we would call a qualified candidate for the Valley of Lemuel. Now, why is that important that we find a qualified candidate for the Valley of Lemuel? Well, if critics of the Book of Mormon are going to find fault with the Book of Mormon, the obvious place to start is in Jerusalem. Because we have a clear point of embarkment on the Book of Mormon account. So it'd be very easy to start there and then follow Nephi's writing and see if it holds up to what's actually there in the desert. Critics have already come out with very strong assertions. For example, there are no rivers in Arabia. <laughs> How could there be a river of Laman? There never have been any timbers or trees growing in Oman by which Nephi could build a ship. There are geographical errors in the Book of Mormon. On the other hand, if you could prove that first Nephi is an accurate historical account, then it would follow that the rest of the Book of Mormon was divinely inspired. Richard? It's a pleasure to be here, and um, George and I haven't had a chance. We've been trying to organize this from thousands of miles apart, so you have to excuse that we are uh, just uh, putting our act together here a little bit. But um, if you remember, uh, cast your minds back to, to Lehi's departure from Jerusalem. Uh, we're told that he uh, goes into the wilderness, and um, there are a number of routes that could have taken him to the Gulf of Aqaba, where they end up at the Red Sea, some of which traveled along the uh, western part of the, the uh, Dead Sea and down to Wadi Araba. Um, but we will just present what we feel, because we don't have time to go into all the details. If you need more, then um, by all means go into the book. But um, we feel that they headed here, immediately across the plain of uh, Jericho, and picked up the route which runs down uh, the length of Arabia, which used to be used for uh, trade and so on. Uh, there are a number of reasons why we believe that. First of all, we're told that um, when uh, Zedekiah, King Zedekiah, if you remember when Jerusalem finally fell uh, to Nebuchadnezzar's army as the walls were breached, he fled through the gate that was uh, near his garden, and he fled east, and um, because that was the quickest way out of, uh, out of uh, Israelite territory. He was captured on the plains of the... Jericho. We're also told that many other residents of Judah did the same thing when Nebuchadnezzar's army came. There seems to be a historical precedent for heading east to get away quickly. And um, Hugh Nibley and others, as pointed out by uh, Kent Brown here, um, have put together an impressive array of evidence that points to Lehi's exodus as a replication of that of the Israelites. In other words, we believe that one of the reasons why Nephi uses the exodus as a teaching tool to lay millennials so often is because it's a reproduction, it's a mirror of the journey they took, so it was directly relevant to Laman and Lemuel. 
The route that we would suggest they took, it takes them here across the uh, north of the Dead Sea. Now, can I just point out this little arrow here? Because uh, I'm going to be talking a little about what the El Kara in a moment. So when you see the photographs, we're talking about an area about two miles north of the Dead Sea and about a mile to the east of the uh, River Jordan. As they were heading east from here, they had an opportunity to pick up two different roads. One of them was called the King's Highway, and the other one was known as the Way of the Wilderness. The King's Highway, um, well, in that case, I'll tell you what, let's just move on to the next picture. If you take a look at the route of the Exodus, uh, this is uh, taken from the, the maps and the new and the new maps in the LDS uh, scriptures. Uh, the route of the Exodus came across the, uh, the plain of Jericho to pick up the way of the wilderness, and then at this portion here came down to join up with the King's Highway, and which eventually brought them down to Izzy and Gavur, which is on the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. Could this be called um, traveling in the wilderness? Well, we believe that, that it certainly could. I mentioned this area known as uh, Wadi El Karar, immediately on the uh, north of the Dead Sea. Well, this was the area where John the Baptist was preaching. We were told that he was preaching in the wilderness. And recently, the church has been found at Wadi El Karar, which marks the place where John the Baptist preached and where Elijah was taken up into heaven. And uh, I had an opportunity to go and visit that. It's in Jordan a few years ago. At that point, it wasn't open to the public, but it may well be open now. If any of you ever go to Jordan, you may want to see it. This is the... Um, the church here, and on the other side of the wadi, there's a, a small building which marks the area where John the Baptist preached. This is where Elijah was meant to have been taken up into heaven. This is according to the um, uh, Bill, uh, Pilgrim of Bordeaux, who wrote about this in 333 AD. So, to bring them to the way of the wilderness, why would we say they travelled in the way of the wilderness? Well, we believe that Lehi, when he departed, took uh, used camels. Uh, this isn't our idea. Uh, Nibley argues very ably to, to say this. Uh, just the tents they would have lived in would have been far too heavy for a man to carry. And when you travel by camel, uh, one of the things you were looking for was a route which was flat and where the sand was compacted enough that camels could travel easily. And so, camel trains used to use uh, the way of the wilderness here, even though there was less water and um, less rainfall and less fodder because it was an easier route for camels to pass over. As they headed further south, they would have joined into the King's Highway. Now, the King's Highway is an area in, in uh, Jordan which travels through mountains in its northern portion. And uh, the route was there because it's an area of highest rainfall. And so the majority of biblical towns and uh, archaeological sites in Jordan actually sit on the King's Highway. There was lots of farmland there, and it was well populated, so it wouldn't really have counted as wilderness per se. But when you get to the southern area, the southern portion, the rainfall here drops to less than 100 millimeters a year, and it's uh, far less populated. And so heading onto the King's Highway there, we feel would still be considered traveling in the wilderness. This is um, the, high, the, King, the modern highway, which uh, follows the route of the old highway across the Wadi Mojib, and in the bottom of here, there's an old Roman uh, Roman Bridge, which marks the site of the old road. As we did this journey, we were able to gather a number of insights as well, which have been useful. I'm going to share just a few of them uh, with you. We don't have time to share more than that. But one of the things that uh, Nephi mentions as they travel is, is the fact his father dwells in a tent. And I had often wondered why he kept reminding us of this. Um, one had wondered if it was a way of showing that his father was some, some wealthy sheikh. Um, some tribal leader or whatever. But um, as I was traveling in a place called al um near the uh, way of the wilderness, I came across this tent and thought, well, I'll take a photograph. And one of the things you have to know in Saudi Arabia when you take photos, it's a very quick way to get arrested. Um, and uh, I wasn't sure what the rules were in Jordan. As I went to take a photograph of this, uh, this tent, a woman came running out shouting and screaming at me. And I thought, oh no, here we go again. And, um, and then her husband came out, and then she started shouting at him, and he ran in and uh, got his uh, gutra and his agal, and put them on, and came out and stood there as, as smartly as he could uh, to pose for this photo, which is very unusual for us. Because it's now